session are Qui and B. Welcome back to the stream of Kaiosone.tv. And now we will have the next talk. If you've got any questions, please put them on Twitter, Mastodon, or, or via the Rocket Chat. If you want to know how to do that, just go onto the streaming.metapond.ccc.de page, press on channel Cowzone, and below the video there is a um, category chat, and there you find all details. Exactly, and the next talk will be in German. Ich weiß nicht, ob es eine englische Übersetzung gibt. I'm not sure if there will be an English translation, but there will be, <laughs> as you're currently listening to it. And it's called DIY during lockdown, a computer without CPU by little Alex. Have fun with little Alex. And maybe with Martin. See you then. We want to speak about Digatron today, which is a little project which I've run across. This is Martin and I'm Alexander. We are both from DU2 from Oakland and we've been working in the cow zone there. And now we wanted to present a little bit what we've been doing the lockdown. For about a year I've been working main or as a large part with old computers and at some point I come to the location where I want to really understand where they really deep in hardware would be working. So I've come across several projects where people were building computers from the 70s um, with their circuits and then I've started doing a few things myself. And then, um, beginning of the year, I found a project where people were building a complete computer. Unfortunately, one of these two developers always had already died at that point. And the people who were selling the kit to do it were no longer available. So I just came up and said, all right, I'm just going to build that myself. They are all standard parts. And then we started. And then each of us built one. So, what is a Gigatron? So, we'll skip this. So, as Alex said, it's built from TTL standard components, and therefore it is a computer that doesn't really have a core processing unit, but just some standard components. So, of course, it is good. It's our project, gigatron.io. And in this picture, you can see an image of this. Oh, yeah, here on the desk, we also have got one, as you can see now. So, exactly, this Gigatron was designed from myself and Kaufnick and uh, Otto Belgus. And from 2018 to 2020, this kit was available, but now. It's no longer built, but fortunately, it's open since mid 2020, so it's source code, the PCB layouts, and everything else was available. But now, also the handbook and the uh, parts list was available, so it wasn't too hard to actually rebuild this. So, if you look at the effort, that's easy to do on a weekend. It's also not so ultra hard to solder, so somebody is good, some experience soldering, somebody can do that for beginners, probably it's not a good idea. Well, that would be my, 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 my approach. Cost-wise, what did we pay? So, I think I had lots of things available, so it was below 100 euros. 
I think the parts were 50, and then there's, of course, the PCB, and um, there's, there's the glass on top, the acrylic glass. So, um, casing, you've got to decide what you do. The, the um, boards themselves, you can have actually cut for, for you. The layout is freely available, so that's what I did. I just ordered a few, but you can also find them. On, 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 on online auctions, so some people did 10 and then just giving them out. Uh, you've got to decide for yourself, but I just had them made for myself. It was no issue. They were quite easy, um, so any kind of uh, made-to-order um, company should be able to do this for you. So let's just have a look at the technical specifications. So. The CPU that we're using is an 8-bit CPU, so therefore um, yeah, this 8-bit for instructions, um, or for um, chained instructions made of several parts. The architecture is called a Harvard architecture, which you can see in the hardware quite easily. So there is a ROM, which is this is the components. This is where the program is running. And then there is an SROM, which is the component here. And this is where the data is saved in runtime. And that's exactly what the Harvard architecture So that program memory and data memory are physically separated. The whole thing may be important to mention. The entire system is an 8-bit RISC CPU. So it's a quite simple CPU, but in the end it can execute one uh, command per, per um, frame, so that makes it quite performant. Um, the only core issue is that it's really limited, so it can load data from uh, from raw map from, and it can do some logical basic functions and or or XOR and CPU can add and subtract, and it can do loops, um, uh, ifs and things like that. But the core issue is that with these eight instructions, programming is quite hard. So it is it is possible to really. Even if you can call this the the, the, the calculation system, but it is possible, but it is quite painful. Um, it's not fun, and then there are no high-level languages um, to box this. No, I don't think. But what you could do is through a virtual CPU. Then, of course, you can. There's a Google specific language. So the solution that you would do when you wanted to have a quite fast CPU that has just can do just very little things. The next step is the based a virtual CPU that so the software emulated vCPU in 16-bit. And there you have a von Neumann architecture. So that means you've got a Harvard hardware based simulated von Neumann architecture that's running in with 16 bits. And why von Neumann architecture can do that? It's a vCPU is running completely in the RAM, so therefore, of course, it can access it however it likes, and of course, can self-modify code or something else, what you can do in the new architecture, that all works here. Right, so there's different sorts of possibilities to get output. So there is, is graphics over VGA, as a you can add a complete normal monitor of VGA, so there's RGB with 64 colors. There's 3.5 uh, millimeters um, headphone plug, and there is a serial port where, or controller that you can, can add. This is for input. And that is originally built for NES controller. Because if I understood it correctly, S controller were available at large numbers and easy to buy, and therefore the developers just built this for this controller. So, so the idea is legitimate. You've got this input output. It was really, you know, we never really planned to make a project, but it was more as a 
it's as it's your fun. And there's a serial product protocol that worked, so people just used it. But if you really want to use a proper computer, that's of course something different that you would want as a game controller. So therefore, there is this little thing here, it's called Plucky Mac Plug Face. There's nothing else as a little Atmel who takes the PS2 protocol and to the serial protocol. And then you can just plug it in here with power supply via the computer and you can also use it in memory, but let's talk about it later. So, for understanding this thing, we need a little bit what binary logic is. Um, that's what we'll do that very fast and march through this. So it's important that we expect for many people already know what we're talking about here, but we're just adding this in uh, in case somebody's interested. So many people are more software oriented and have never really looked at the architecture of computer. So binary logic, that means electrical potentials um, are bina binary circumstances, so it's one, zero. So five volt is one and zero volt is illogically zero. So one could say if you have a power supply with a plug switch when the switch is closed and the lamp is on, that's the, the logical circumstance one. And if it's open, then it is the logic so situation zero. So there's some semiconductors like a diode. So that is means current can only view in one direction, um, and is stopped in the other direction. So depending on how you put that diode in there, either the bulb will be on, so it lets the power through, or it doesn't. So therefore, the light is. That be zero. And there's bipolar transistors. So this is a component that lets current through depending on the control circuit. So depending on um, the circumstances, you can use um, a higher main circuit than the control circuit, so therefore you can have um, an increase of the current. And there's two types of transistors, NPN, they put uh, power through when the control circuit is on, and PNP, where, where it lets power through when it, the control circuit is off. So here we have two different types that use these effects. For this control system, PNP or NPN, we both just have to agree on the logic if it's positive 5V or if that is 1 or if that is uh, or minus 5V. So whenever there's transistors, now here we have NPN. This is how it looks as a control circuit. So on the left, we've got the NPN transistor as letting current through the left side. If, if it's plus, then the lamp's on. And if it's minus, uh, minus current, then it's off. Or the PNP transistor is exactly the other way around. There's also uniperlar semiconductors. Generally, they work similar. It doesn't depend on a control circuit, so it just depends generally on the current. And there's two types of uniperlar transistors. So, so there is an N-channel one whenever there's a control. On positive or a negative control power. There's a logic gate, which you can create by putting this into series. The concrete 
uh, circuit then depends on the lot uh, use logic so building it using diodes is differing from building it from transistors of course for example we have an AND gate and if both of them are both of the entries are on one the exit is also on one in an all the exit is one if one of the two entries is one and xr is only if and exact uh, if one of the two entries and exactly one of the two entries is one then the exit is one as well so there are different names for this one but yeah we have a few of these standard gates in this machine as well you can also combine these to build some basic memory and the like and but that's basically the uh, mo uh, the main components of every computer and yeah combining these gates you can also create more complex systems for example flip-flops that are able to remember states you can also build something that adds together two binary numbers and that would look something like this those are standard gates that are by combination uh, by being combined in a certain way create complex behavior and yeah these combinations they are known for, have been known for decades now you can create any number of things and basically any cpu can be built this way and any given complexity can be built we are also showing some of these things that are built and this example is a two-bit full adder so an adding machine so any calculation can be done using these gates yeah we were talking about the option of building these gates from simple electronic components as well and there are different gate classes for example the diode resistor logic that would consist of diodes and resistors and depending on how you build them you can have a logical AND or a logical OR seen here on the left and on the right so depending on the voltage if the voltage is on both entries then it's yeah so on the right side there's the OR and on the left there's the AND you can also build these using resistors and transistors and then it looks a bit different but it's completely equivalent so the functionality is the same and yeah we have to say the further we go the less power is actually used so in some of these versions there is a lot of uh, rather high current and if you want to build something very complex that's possible but you suddenly uh, you very soon will need a lot of power you'll need your own power plant and this logic is a lot better but you're still using current to uh, to decide what's running so you still need a lot of power we sometimes have diode logic but yeah we will later get to the CMOS logic so the next step is the transistor transistor logic that's basically similar to the normal transistor resistor logic however this circuit consists out of multi-emitter transistors so you don't only have one emitter but you can have two or three and using that you can create logical connections with just one one part so you get a smaller footprint and you also need less current and then there's the 74,000 logic family 
those are logical standard components also uh, already integrated into an integrated circuit or an IC. And that comes back to the DTL row. So that was a TTL logic. And those are, as far as I know, mostly CMOS. So they hardly need any current. They are usually called 74, then a, a short hand depending on the technology and then the num uh, the name of the part so there is could be a CMOS then a shirt key there could also be a TTL I'm not certain about that now and yet they are also available for different voltage levels we are usually working 5 volts here and this logic family it provides a lot uh, several gates on one IC so, for example, this chip has four gates. So instead of building it yourself, you have a lot of these in this. So the 74X08 would have four AND gates. And you could use these four gates directly. Of course, this is also available in a bit more complex version. For example, the 74X283, those, that would be a four-bit adder. So if you remember the adder using 2-bit from earlier, this is the same but for 4 bits. And if you then compare this with a few AND gates, this IC has more gates than the first one because it's a more complex function and it also is available in more complex so for example the 74x8832 that would be a 32-bit ALU but we did not use these so we did not use a complete ALU in this machine so the logic is really built in logic gates and it's important for being able to understand the system. So the more gates you are, you combine into one chip, the more difficult it becomes to understand how everything works. And that's why I really like this project because it's not using too complex IC. Yeah. So yeah, it's not using ICs that are too complex. And yeah, this is also everything available in different technologies, but that's not really relevant now. Yeah, so this device has an EEPROM right here. It's a normal standard EEPROM. What was it? 1040 or 1024? And it's an EEPROM that for TTL or CMOS, well, it's known, it's nothing fancy, it's just a normal part. You can basically use any old standard EEPROM. You don't have to change anything. And here the vCPU and a few programs are in there. But that's part of the Harvard architecture. Then we have this module, the SPROM 32K. And unlike today's RAM, that is static RAM. And what we have in our computers is dynamic RAM, and this static RAM is usually can uh, is built using capacitors that are accessed using a transistor, and of course you have to refresh the capacitors because it's leaking current and using SRAM this is not necessary because the SRAM is use, is built together using logic gates that we've showed earlier 
so it needs voltage continuously. It's not like DRAM where you can just write something and then leave it alone and then read it out. But this continuously needs current to keep this state. And the reason for SRAM is that you can make it a lot simpler. So the circuit gets a lot simpler. Yeah, control unit. Well, we called it a control unit. This area is all the control logic implemented. On the slides you might be able to see it a bit better than on the... Yeah, so here the diodes, they define how certain commands are encoded in binary. And if a command is loaded from EEPROM, then the diode network decides what part of the circuit gets addressed and with what parameters. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's that. Okay, next we have the program, program counter. That works by... So in the EEPROM you have all the commands in a row and the operations including parameters and the computer needs to know what instruction is the next one to load and for that we have the program counter and normally it works by loading the next instruction from the program counter then the program counter gets uh, increased by one so in the next step it then loads the instruction the program counter is pointing to and so jumps can be implemented using the program counter so if you have an if then you could either start the next command or the one after and you can do that by adjusting the program counter so then the um, timing generator or the tech generator that's just a quartz nothing fancy just a simple part but it's amazing how that works with the rather slow timing but yeah the, the quartz exists but it's rather rare actually why you need this frequency it's a bit uh, early now to talk about it but it's about graphics and the hardware has to be in sync with the display if you choose another uh, tact or another timing then the picture does not fit to the display anymore and it can't be displayed anymore if you if we build a serial output then it would be less critical then the timing would just have to fit to the to the interface so yeah we were deciding on a rather strange timing instead to get make that easier then we have the power supply not too difficult either we have a mini USB for voltage entry then we have a sender diode that can shortcut if there's too much power on it we have a capacitor that cleans up the power supply and then an LED that shows us if there is power or not and if the power is too low for a certain time then there is a reset signal that leads to the chips starting up properly because if that were not give, uh, given and the chips would start up at 1.2 volts already it would be an under underdefined voltage and it would be outside specification and it might even work but some might work others might not and it would just be 
das Ding würde nie in deinem Unknown. Leben It wouldn't be known how everything started up. So that looks like a transistor that's actually um, something that decides now is the current time to get the current going now is the time to stop it. So, instruction pipeline. Genau dieses so this Gigatron uses a pipelining structure for the instructions. Um, so there's two registers that give the instructions and the um, connected data. So in one, so, um, so in one attack, uh, the data is taken from the registers, and the second one, it is get executed. So this pipelining approach means that otherwise you would need to have parts of the system or the CPU to, to wait. And with the pipelining, they are separated in smaller part instructions, and then they can be executed, sometimes in parallel at the same time. So here with this approach, we can load and execute an instruction at the same time. So theoretically, by this, you can increase the attack frequency. So the registers, so the registers they sit up here and here. In this case, we've got some printing on the board, so it looks nice and you can remember what was where, but you of course don't have to do that. So it's X and Y register as multipurpose registers, so you can just save values there and read them back. This register is a counter, which has got also something to do with the video, so it can iterate addresses faster. And the accumulator is a register uh, as part of logical unit. So the calculation unit is responsible for creation of the VGA signal, so there is no extra chip or, or, or component that creates the VGA signal or the audio, it's all the CPU if you could call it that, um, which is responsible for that. I think calculation system is probably a better idea to say this here. So this is these two. So the idea is that there's also buffering and the access to the control systems, and there's also the registers who are doing this, this whole uh, Gigatron has an 8-bit bus, it has all the components connected, and this buffer is to make sure that it's first read from the bus into the buffer, and then from the buffer um, the actual evaluation is done, or something is first read into the buffer, and then it is on, written on the bus. So, this is the arithmetic and logic unit, which is part of several multiplexers and uh, two, two RAM chips. And interestingly, this means these are all the instructions that the Gigatron can do, which are part of the arithmetic logic unit implemented. So I found this process in a scientific paper from, I think it was 1982. So at that point, somebody publicized this kind of circuit. So in the DE Zen, it was handed around. So if you really want to have a look at the, this plan, it was publicized, it was completely uh, go over the frame of this talk, but it is possible to have all this, con to really understand the functions of this process. And you can really understand every single function here. But through logic analyzer or an oscillator, you can really see what this thing is doing at the moment, and that I found really, really fascinating about this part. So this was for me the, the most amazing part of this thing. 
Genau, da gibt es dann noch. Es gibt zwei ICs für Addressing Memory, which is called because this system supports several modes of addressing memory. So it could either be coming from the X register or this address comes from the Y register. And all these components are just multiplexes who um, then give the pins of the memory address to the pins. And this is here the um, IC for the input. And this is how the input is going to be handled. Das ist genau der Ausgabeteil ist ein kleines. The output part is a bit more complex, so there it is. No, it's actually not very complex, you could say. So it's still simple. We have the issue of leaving the digital world and have to go back into the analog world. We've got to create analog signals which humans can understand. Because we are not digital. So there's several outputs. One of them is the LEDs, which can be accessed. Then there is this audio plug output, and then there's a calculation output that works for the VGA output. So the audio output is a, a simple uh, digital to analog converter with a network of resistors. And the current dividers that are there then actually create a signal. That's the CPU doing. This is no extra sound circuit, so this is all being handled by the CPU. And the same is with the VGA output. So the VGA signal is red, green, blue, and the synchronization signal. And here you can see why it has such a weird quartz. It is because the, these synchronizing and core signals are all matching. It has to be this frequency. And also here, the 64 colors the system can do are being regulated via the resistors for every color separately. So that turns into 64 colors through mixing them. So the output is very simple by VGA, so every single simple VGA monitor can show data, so signals from this device. So software-wise, so I, there is just a handful of standard games you can do, so it's, there is a ROM that is that's running here for the Harvard architecture is is open source so you can just download it and, and change it and create your own things with it so the games here all these are the classics so there is an image um, program for image viewing um, if you look at this is at the level of uh, early 1980s computers through it being able at 64 colors with a reasonably uh, high resolution you can actually look really really good the images i have to say so if you Look at ZX81, what, what kind of references can do. This is really surprising what this can do. Say so a classic mandible fractal. And of course, a, a just one that works as well. Well, übrigens sehr praktisch ist. Damit habe ich viel gelernt, wo ich mit dem Ding rumgespielt habe, was da gerade los ist, was da passiert. Du solltest vielleicht noch kurz erklären, was. The Voss monitor is. It's a monitor which I can look into the memory itself. So from the vCPU, it's not of the. I can't look at the what's happening in the Harvard architecture, but I know that, and I can monitor just separately. <coughs> if I understand correctly, the Voss monitor can also write. Yes, it can also write into the memory. And then, of course, the most important thing: you can, of course, write your own programs. There, at this point, there's a project that want to create more performant basic dialects, but I haven't tested this. Have you? No. 
Ja. Oh, this thing is really cool. So, at the beginning, we already said that there is a serial connection. So, RS232, so it's really something proprietary, so that you can talk with it properly, you need to have something. There is a, something a tiny, but you could also use an Arduino or some other Atmel. It is possible to use the memory of the Arduino as a mass memory for this device, if you so want it. So, so here it's, I think, 320 bytes or something like that. Good. Oh, just about 300. But of course, you can use a larger one. Then you've got a few kilobytes where you can say something. Theoretically, you could you could put a large ad, you could even make a connection to an SD card. But in general, you can use a serial port to transport software you've written to put it on the device or take it off. Okay, then let's show what this thing can do. It's running with 5 volt. A normal USB power supply. It's got about 100 milliamps power. One other thing that's interesting to show you functionally, so the calculation system is actually what's creating the screen input, so actually creating the screen input. If you have a good look, you can see these black bars. The background of this is that the CPU, so it's not CPU, it's a calculation core is basically creating the image and in these points it can actually not do anything so it's can only do that while jumping back um, and the black bars above and below the screen I can tell the device Show is all lines. It can only calculate the software when it's not having to show anything. So I can ask him to show me everything, but I can also tell it to leave out one or two bars. Now it's just one out of three lines shown. And this way the system is quite fast, and this way it's quite slow. So let's just open a program. It's called Eraser. It's a very classical racing game. You can see I, I take a few lines away. And this is how. So. And of course, now it's running much, much, much faster. And now I'm out of the road, but... That is significantly... How does it accelerate with A? So... The issue with the current implementation is that it loses one key when another key is pressed, so accelerating and control and direction is not possible at the same time. So. So. What's also nice to see is here with another implementation for a man abroad. How long it takes. So he's now started at the top and is and if I take and then he has just much, much more time for calculating. And of course, comparatively faster the whole thing goes. But it keeps the pixels still in memory, so I can have him calculate fast, and then when he's done the result, I can show the result in full beauty. I don't think we'll have the whole mantle abroad. Apple man, full calculation. I think probably now it'll take three to four minutes. No. This way takes about an hour. 
So. So. We already decided that we want to show the pictures, so this is yeah. Who remembers an old CT from the 80s or 90s? It's a German computer magazine. This picture was basically the standard to demonstrate the graphics capabilities. And for a computer of this size, this is really amazing. I was really surprised when I saw that. Okay, well, those are other games, you know, the usual stuff. What I really like or find exciting is basic. You can actually write basic code, the usual things, a print, the hello world, obligatory. Ah, I have a German keyboard, and it's usually set to a German keyboard, but not in basic. I forgot about that. Yeah. So. Now I created a loop and here also you can see that the speed changes drastically depending on how many lines you are actually showing. What else could we show? Well, maybe the was monitor. What would you like to show there? Yeah, the was one is actually was delivered with the Apple One. What were the shortcuts again? I don't know, just enter the address and then it shows you the value. Yeah, you could do some other things. But well, that was a long time ago that I used this. Yeah, so in RAM there is nothing there right now. But for debugging this is quite useful. So the was one is able to do more. It's a rather small program, I think 400 bytes or something. But using that we can really look into the RAM. There are also things that you can write to, write into it. And also that it could show the corresponding letters. But I don't really remember right now how that was possible. It's a nice program. You can find it for all kinds of devices online. Yeah, it's nice for having a quick look up. Well, I can't think of anything else. So I can just let this run. Here this takes so little power that you can even have it on full resolution without making a difference. Yeah, we have a sound. The sound doesn't sound too bad. So audio doesn't sound too bad for being so simple. Yeah, the blinking lights, you can also program those. Yeah, all in all, it's a very nice system to understand how to create a computer using very simple logic. And you can have it as complex as you like or go as deep as you like to see what is happening. Ah, oh, well, I think we are done. Well, thank you very much.
Well, thank you for the talk. And we also have the speakers available for questions. So let's begin. Let's jump right in. So we have a question from IRC. So what's the status of the native force of the system? Or for the system? And we are missing sound. We have another question from Quest. How good is the vCPU compared to Sweet 16? Are we are missing some though. Okay, we are working on the speaker sound. So the question for NATO Force, and we cannot immediately answer that. So how similar is the vCPU to Sweet 16? So I know not really a lot about the V16. I've worked with this one and I can't really answer that. Martin, maybe can you? I don't know Sweet 16, so it's not really possible to compare. So I have to say that here what was interesting more was the, the hardware, so not the software so much, but really You've, of course, got to have a look at the software. Okay, then, vielen Dank. Okay. Thank you very much. Then there was also the wish to receive the slides. But they should be linked in the file plan and the schedule as well. So that should be the case. Or is anyone against it? No. That's fine. Well, okay, Sweet 16 is apparently the vCPU of Apple Basic. Ah, okay. Well, okay. So those were basically the questions from the chat. Apart from that, most people want to thank for a very nice talk. I want to hand that over. And, and yeah, well, if you like the talk, you might like the next one as well. I could imagine. Because at 5 p.m., it will go on here with the talk Retro Computing, also with little Alex. As and Martin and Marcus and a small note from your translators as of now this following talk will not be translated because it is during our meeting so no translators